Uh, John Corleano is um, not only a brilliant composer, now I know I've said everyone is either important, nice, a great human being, Morton Gould is indeed a great human being if you were here, and very funny. John also has a sense of humor, but I think it's a little more on the diabolical strain. <laughs> That's up to you to uh, figure out. John Corleano is a composer that touches a big public. In a time when music, concert music, is really in trouble, where there is no composer worldwide that has a big impact like Stravinsky did. You didn't have to know Stravinsky's music or Bartok's music or Schoenberg's music. Nobody ever did, but they certainly knew he was a great musician. Today there's no single force, not since the death of Sostakovich in 75, that every country in the world, know the music or not, knows that that is a great name in music. I have a feeling, though, that as John's career progresses, and as you see, he's certainly a young composer by the standards of what we'll have next week on stage, a man who John studied with, the great Otto Luning. I talked to him today, and I said that, you know, he's now a peer. I called him Lord Luning. He was once a Kentucky colonel, but now he's a lord. John's symphony has just been recorded on CD. We're going to hear a little bit of it later. It's a work that has caused a tremendous commotion because of its emotional content. He's been writing an opera for some time, and we're going to get into that idea of writing an opera in the late 20th century. It must be an absolute crazy thing to do. Corleano came from an extraordinary family. His father, John Sr., was concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic for 23 years. His mother is a fine pianist. And he grew up wanting to be in music, and I think that maybe you were discouraged a bit. Is that true? Well, sure. Uh, my father did not want me to go into a field that uh, basically, I tell my students, composing is really a giant hobby and uh, not a living. And so he wanted me to become a, a lawyer, doctor, or something dependable. Um, and I think he did discourage me for that reason. And only after he'd played a piece of mine, which he finally had to play because he was sort of blackmailed into it by uh, other people playing it, uh, did he change his mind and become supportive. Hmm. So at least before he, he died, he had, uh, you had his approval in a yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, I wrote him a violin and piano sonata, and he, uh, I gave it to him in 1963, and he put it in his closet and said, I look at too many pieces and never looked at it. Uh, and then I, I entered and it won the Spoleto Festival Chamber Music Competition, it was played there, and he didn't say anything. And then it was played in London by the Constant Mass at London Symphony, and he didn't say anything and it's getting closer to home. And then in Boston, Roman Totenberg <laughs> played it, and uh, his friends started saying, when are you going to learn your son's piece? And he didn't say anything either, but he took the music out of the closet and started practicing. And uh, the next thing I knew, he had scheduled it for the New York premiere. He did that, he recorded it, and played it until he died um, a lot of times. And then he was supportive after that. So it was a good feeling to have that. Yeah. That, that totality, when a father doesn't support a son in, in, uh, that wants to be an artist, who is himself an artist, there's, there's that conflict. Uh, your violin sonata, by the way, is uh, really a beauty, a gorgeous work that has been played in many places. And that brings uh, uh, me to this point. John, your, your music has never, at least from my point of view, uh, had a hard time in getting accepted. Uh, you, you seem to be well known since you're about 30. I mean, you have really had quite an, an, um, an amazing career. Not only instrumentalists of importance have played your music uh, constantly, but um, uh, conductors have, have gone to it uh, and, and made a great success out of it. Everyone wants to do the symphony now, the whole world. How do you feel about this? Are you, are you... I don't dislike it. Yeah. Um, no, some people, you know, get very, very nervous with all this success. Um, no, that's, um, that kind of syndrome is a real problem. Uh, some years ago, a critic of the New York Times interviewed me for the magazine section of the Times, and uh, he came in, and the first thing he said to me was, I read something in all your reviews, a word, and that word disturbs me. The word is communicates. 
And uh, I had this horrible sinking feeling that I'd done something wrong by communicating with an audience. And <laughs> then I sort of closed down and didn't speak to him about much because I was inhibited, of course. And after, luckily, he came several times because it was a major article. And the second or third time, I finally um, said, look, I really can't open up with you and be honest with you because of the thing you said the first time we met. And I recounted what he had said. I said, what is wrong with communicating? He said, well, he said, I was taught that if a composer is reaching his audience and the audience is liking it today, that he's selling out and he's pandering and, uh, in fact, uh, you know, he's not really writing great music uh, because he's so concerned with his audiences. And I said, well, I guess if you have that set of values, you must have real contempt for the greatest panderer of all time, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, since nobody was a greater sellout in your mind because he was obsessed with audience reaction. I said, you know, he'd go to a city and he would change one of the movements of a symphony because he thought the public would like a different movement and just stick it in. Uh, the man had no integrity at all. And uh, of course, he turned white and he said, Mozart, you know, fell to his knees, shaking. And I said, look, what's wrong with him wanting to reach audiences being okay? And how do you justify that and my wanting to reach audiences not being okay? Um, I said, I think you're caught in the 19th century German romantic trap of the misunderstood composer in his... Um, you know, in his citadel, writing music for the next generation, the prophet that no one understands. And I said, I really don't think that uh, that's a real 20th century attitude. I think that's a 19th century attitude. Um, and it was very strange. We had kind of mutual psychoanalysis going on during this um, interview. And I think he, for a while, he turned into a better critic. He slipped back. I won't mention his <laughs> name because he slipped back into his old problem that when the audience likes something, he gets angry. Uh, but for a while, he was actually being fair about it and seeing whether he liked it or not, which I thought was the right attitude. But see, that's the problem. Um, when I started writing, most composers had that attitude. Now, they don't anymore, and I think we're in a much healthier frame of mind because composers today really are interested in reaching audiences. There are young composers like uh, Lowell Lieberman, who happens to be in the audience here, who write music that goes right to an audience. And the young generation is not upset by communicating to an audience. It's not a bad word that uh, the audience, you know, audience approval. But at the time I was writing, it was. Um, and I really was a bit of an outcast for many years uh, because I didn't pay any attention to that. I thought it was nonsense. Uh, but now young composers don't, and it's a much healthier frame of mind. For example, I might tell you that I got a phone call today from the Chicago Symphony. I was composer in residence there for three years. And they just won, based upon the program we've done for the past three years, they've just won an ASCAP award for inventive programming, which is a great honor, and their civic orchestra, for the second year in a row, has won the ASCAP award for the first training orchestra to program mu new music so wonderfully. So they have two, double awards given today for the best orchestra in the United States and the best training orchestra. And I called up Henry Fogel. I said, Henry, have your subscriptions dropped any? And he said, absolutely not. We're packing them in. So I said, well, doesn't that say something then? Doesn't it say that we can play new music and if it's presented with excitement and um, a sense of real love, as the Chicago Symphony did, uh, we're not turning anyone away. We're having standing ovations with world premieres. I just learned also yesterday that uh, my symphony is number 18 on the charts in Billboard in two weeks. It's just been out for two weeks. 18th, including Mozart, Haydn, Handel, Beethoven, and all that. Now, I'm, I mean, and if you look at Billboard, there are a lot of American contemporary pieces that are right up there. I think it's a very much healthier time. In fact, uh, Mr. Barenboim recorded two records, and they were released two weeks ago. One was on Held in Laban and, Zareth, and um, Till Erlenspiel, and the other one was my symphony. The symphony is on the charts in Billboard. The other is not. Not because it's not a great performance, which it is, but because there are about 25 CDs of it already out. And people are beginning to realize that um, that's just another performance now, and that perhaps new music is going to answer the problem of going to concerts and hearing the same old thing like Chateau wine tasting, just a little bit different. Um, you know, I mean, that's all very good, and I'm, I love great performers, don't get me wrong, but it's not all there is to the art of music making. And so, not at all. It's, it's, it will become detrimental if, the, if it becomes only a performing It turns art. in on itself. It turns yeah. in on itself. And that's when orchestras start closing and things, people start going to the musical theater and other places for their artistic, musical, creative input, which is a shame. Why should they have to go to hear musicals for that? Why can't yeah. they go to the concert hall? John, I think that you know, the time has come. Remember, when you were uh, starting, as you were talking about this, you were coming at the tail end of this 
tremendously dreary academic time, you know, where everyone was uh, working with the 12 tones and, and it was very uh, sustained by, acad by academe. I might say but, I use 12 tone technique too. Yeah. It's great. It's a wonderful but technique. But you're an eclectic. You'll be able, you'll use what you need. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it really is useful and wonderful. It's just that um, there's no one way to write anymore. I think that audiences are, and it's about time, just as some performers are getting sick and tired of the same Beethoven sonata, that they're really looking forward to some new music. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. So the Beethoven nine, day and night. Right. Now, of course, on radio, you have uh, one movement of the Fifth Symphony to wake you up. Oh, yes. I was, I was told by somebody at WQXR that they had a um, market research man come in, and he told them to cut all the slow movements out of the symphonies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I was told that in 1975, <laughs> but... Uh, I was able to hold out for a little longer. Well, you said something you know important about uh, communication, and it's no longer a sin, it's, it's now important. And so you were one of the first uh, of the new breed then to communicate. You wrote, uh, you wrote works for uh, films, that marvelous far out um, fellow by the name of Ken Russell. I think you okay. had al also the, the nomination yeah. for the Academy Award right. for the best score. You didn't win it, as Copeland had won once for the heiress, right. but uh, that's not bad. Not and bad. Um, I remember that helped a great deal to get your name known. I think it was around a 19, what, 80 score? 80, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Altered States is a Ken Russell movie, um, and uh, you know Ken Russell loves classical music and knows an awful lot oh. about it, and has done a lot of films about composers. And he went to the LA Philharmonic uh, while he was filming Altered States, and they were performing Zarathustra, which is what he went to hear, but also my clarinet concerto. And he heard that and then called and asked me to do mm. the score because he wanted a very far out wild score. He didn't want a Hollywood composer. He wanted, in fact, he wanted me to go to my limits in terms of sonorics and, and, and um, hallucinatory music because Altered States is basically about a man who undergoes uh, various hallucinations and regresses into a prim primeval state. So a lot of the uh, score is with no dialogue at all, but hallucinations. When which, you composed it, did you have to regress into oh, the... I always uh, regress when I compose. Into the womb. You always <laughs> regress? What do you mean by that? I compose with a towel like Linus next to me, and <laughs> I cry a lot. Um, well, composing is very, uh, I find it very upsetting, uh, because um, you, what I think of it is someone running hurdles. Um, you know, you run, you see the hurdle in front of you, you can't know what, you don't know what to do. You finally get over it and you leap over it. And as you run, there's the next one. And then there's the yeah. next one. And it's really facing your inadequacies. Um, I find it awful. I love to have composed, but actually composing is another whole issue. Uh, I, I, what do you mean facing the inadequacies of well, the next? Well, my inadequacies. Uh, when you compose, basically speaking, um, when I compose, ba I sit down and I have absolutely, my mind goes completely blank. And uh, it's not like the MGM movie where the symphony was born that night. It, uh, you know, it doesn't happen that <laughs> way. It takes years. And for me, it, I have to put my imagination to overdrive. I have to get myself in enough pain that my mind actually will go to work and come out with solutions. And usually that happens when I'm in the grocery store or something, the solution you know, comes at me. But, but before then, it's just not knowing what the answer is. And living with not knowing for years, which is when you write a piece, how long it takes, is a very frustrating experience. And only it, near the end do you feel any sense that you really have it. It's also, of course, the, a time art. So you're, you're constantly involved with, oh, you have just started your symphony, your symphony number one. You never had any idea that it would extend to 43 minutes, you see. That oh, alone. I did. I plan out the whole piece first. I do the architecture of the work before I write the music. Um, oh my God, so you're not in that much pain after all. Oh, I'm in terrible pain because that means for about two-thirds or at least more than half the time there's no music. There's only, I type letters to myself, I draw pictures, I think about it, but there's no music. The music comes at the end. Now, you know, Rilke once was, uh, he, he was so neurotic, someone said, uh, why don't you go to a... Uh, analyst and he said oh I don't want anyone to take my demons and angels away so obviously you're not going to go to any shrink to get out of oh, pain. Oh I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> and then what? But, uh, but it seems to be that way I mean whenever I start writing a new piece it's just like starting as a child again you really just I start and I say doesn't, doesn't it ever get easier? No. No it really doesn't. Um, it's just the way it is. I mean, look, it's what I do. I mean, yeah. it's hard to do anything. I is think. it what you love, though? I, uh, I even love though doing it. Yeah, I love doing it. But as I said, I love it when, not when I'm starting a piece. I can't say yeah. when I'm starting a piece, I'm very happy. 
Let's hear uh, the, just the first section of Altered States. Yeah. Let me just tell you what this is. This is the first hallucination. Uh, in the film, this was cut in half because of various um, cinematic reasons. What you will hear is kind of a trance-like state where he's in this um, uh, isolation booth, kind of floating in water. And then you'll suddenly hear the bleeding of these Arabic oboes, which is the beginning of the hallucination, where he has all sorts of religious symbols. So you will hear a little bit of um, snatches of um, Rock of Ages, the hymn, which because his father was a Pentecostal uh, minister and he has flashes of old religious symbols and then he has sacrifices of goats and all sorts of seven-eyed Christs on crosses with wind blowing through it and all sorts of things. So what starts out as very tranquil ends up in a roar of sound. All these sounds are natural sounds. This piece is played by symphony orchestras. Um, a lot of people have the CD of this and think that it's very electronic but that's actually making instruments sound like electronic instruments. They're all doing this live. Okay. We'll hear about four minutes from Altered States. First hallucination. Thank you. 
Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not many composers get a chance to have such a canvas, you know, for uh, um, film music as, as one could have with uh, uh, Ken Russell. He must have liked this score very much. He did. He loved it. He loved it. Yeah. Um, when you hear your own music, you're listening to your music. You may not have heard this for five months or two years. What's the reaction? Uh, is there the, the possibility that you don't like it or that uh, you've now moved in such a different direction you don't even know who it is? Or perhaps the performance bothers you so much? What are some reactions? Well, the performance could be a problem, you know, especially recording. I really, if it is a bad recording, I just hate listening to it because it always grates me that it wasn't better. Yeah. This is a good performance. These are Hollywood musicians. They sight read it once, recorded it once, and went on to the next cue. Uh, hmm. It's pretty staggering. I don't know any orchestra alive that could do that, but these people do, um, and learned all the new techniques with once through. That's what they're used to doing. Um, this is a good recording. Um, I don't mind listening to things, but I have to be in the right mood because sometimes, like listening to any piece you put on, you're not in the mood for Beethoven or Mozart. Sometimes they're not in the mood for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, uh, I like to listen to other things, chamber music, um, a lot of other contemporary music. Um, and when I listen to a new recording, I, I get very frustrated because I'm listening to all the things that went wrong. This is old enough that it doesn't bother me anymore. The symphony um, is in, it, it's a good recording. We worked hard to make it a good recording, but it's still going to grit my teeth a little bit through areas that you probably won't hear that are going to bother me because I know they could have been better. Uh, so usually about a year until something's about a year old, it frustrates me listening to it. Uh, do you ever feel that perhaps you could conduct it better? No, no, no. That's a specialist job. Um, I didn't conduct this score. Christopher Keen did. It's very unusual in Hollywood because they make a lot more money when the uh, composer conducts it. But I remember seeing John Barry when I was there. Um, it was quite amusing. Uh, he, he had an entire orchestra with earphones on, and they were listening to a click track and playing away, and he was conducting with his arms just waving about, having absolutely nothing to do with anything. And they were playing, not looking at him, of course, because he had nothing to do with what they were playing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they do that because there's this wonderful little clicks that get fed to these earphones, and they just play to it. Well, I didn't want click tracks, because it's very mechanical, and also, this is the kind of music that you really need, someone to cue people in and to get them moving on. And the orchestra members came up to me afterwards and thanked me so much for having a real conductor, because they barely ever play under real conductors. Uh, they always play under composers who are making more money. Hmm. I want to ask you this question. Um, you love instruments. I mean, your work is idiomatic. I'll never forget when I first heard any John Corleano was in 1976, Alice Tully Hall. Um, it was James Tocco, right. and the, it was the work yours. Etude Fantasy, a 20-minute major work. It starts, I think, three, four minutes of the left hand. Very difficult, tremendously dramatic. It was like bringing the, the virtuoso age back into, uh, into the 70s. And he made a great success with it. And then I started listening to more of your music. I heard your piano concerto. I said, my God, this is a man that really, he, he combines, you know, real theatrics uh, with uh, idiomatic writing. I heard the oboe concerto, I heard the flute concerto. I said, my God, this man knows how to compo compose for the flute. Well, how did you learn how to, how to well, do this? Um, it's sort of true, not 100%. Um, I'm I'm I don't, wrong? Well, I don't, I don't play the instruments, and I do call up colleague friends a lot uh, when I'm writing, like a flute player, when I'm writing the flute concerto and so forth. I had friends who I would be able to call up, and I have, from piccolo to contrabassoon, I have telephone numbers. And anytime I'm composing something and I have a question, I call them up and they play it over the phone to me and I talk, talk it through. So I get a lot of good advice. But that's good business. But you must have a, a real flair for instruments. I just think I just like to hear them do what they do well, or what they can be stretched to do well. It's stretching instruments I do more than um, writing for them. I stretch their capabilities uh, mm -hmm. because I, it's like the four minute mile. Uh, for example, in the Pied Piper um, recording, James Galway, works. James Galway, uh, James Galway commissioned a piece. He recorded the piece and played it a lot. Um, in the recording, I edited his cadenza. In I took all the breaths out that I didn't like, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So it was inhuman. No one could play it like that. And Jimmy heard it and he called me up and said, "Gee, I played that well." <laughs> and I said, "You sure did, Jimmy." And now he plays it like that. 
he doesn't know that he doesn't have, that he has to take a breath, so he doesn't take one. Uh, it's a, and it's the four-minute mile. When you get people and you make them do what's impossible, when um, Stanley Drucker saw my clarinet concerto, he thought it was impossible. When he played it in 1977, everybody thought only Stanley Drucker could play it, and now university students play it with their college orchestras. Hmm. Um, you just take people and pull them into another realm. Now, if you know too much about the instrument, you can fall into the trap of writing comfortably for the instrument and not stretching it. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to like to learn about the instrument by writing for it more than know too much about it to begin with. Mm -hmm. Stravinsky did that with his violin concerto. He said uh, he didn't want to study the great violin concertos because he didn't want to fall into the patterns of their solutions. He wanted to make his own solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's important to know about the instruments, but I also think it's important to discover more about it when you're writing. I might add the Etude Fantasy, a pianist uh, who played a Tuesday night, Alison Brewster, who's a wonderful pianist, um, is in the audience here. Uh, she she played, just played it in uh, Merkin Hall quite wonderfully. I mean, uh, that pianists play that piece. That piece you, is certainly not gone into obscurity like... Yeah, like but you have gone. to be a monster pianist to play it. Yeah. You absolutely do. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, incredible. It's, I, I also heard... Not a, a grade four piece. Did you ever hear of a boy by the name of Arthur Hart, by the way? Yes, I did. He played it in yes. my Juilliard uh, piano yes. literature class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told him to go play for you to see, you know, but he I don't did, know if he, he did. did. He, he did, did a very huh? good job. Wow. Um, let's talk a bit about um, influences. Who are the composers that have meant most to you growing up in the world? Well, of course, you know, um, the music you're hearing now is later music. Um, we'll play a little of my piano concerto, um, and you can hear earlier stuff written in the 60s, and I was very influenced by uh, American Americana, um, Copeland, of course, Stravinsky, which came out of, Cop Copeland came out of Stravinsky, and Bernstein came out of Copeland, and all of that world, and Piston, and the neoclassical American school. Uh, I was fascinated by the clean sounds of that world, and so a lot of those early pieces are like that. Um, then I got fascinated with the idea of notation, and the freedom uh, the, of, from restriction that you can get by not necessarily thinking of notation in the traditional sense, but in fact thinking of what you want to do and then finding a way to write it down. And of course there are other composers like Penderewski who do that wonderfully. But interestingly, the music that very often influences me the most is music I don't like rather than music I do like. Hmm. Um, because I like to listen to things that I don't like because it makes me mad and I usually say, why couldn't that be done another way? And it gives me <laughs> ideas. When I listen to music I do like, I sit back and say, isn't that wonderful? What a great composer, and um, it's more complacent. What listening. don't you like? Minimalism. I mm -hmm. uh, generally don't like it. Um, it's simple-minded and rather dumb and pretentious half the time, I, I think, and, uh, and usually technically fairly inept. I'm not talking about all the composers. What are the great are. composers? Are there composers you, you, you dislike and can learn from even today? Well, I'm not crazy about the orchestration of the great German composers like Brahms. I mean, I would love to, I would love to have the nerve someday to take a red pencil and cross out about half the notes of the violin concerto. And uh, because you can never hear the violin in live performances, it's only really good when you hear records. When you hear a live performance of the Brahms concerto, the violin sounds puny. Yeah. because of the orchestration is so tubby. Isn't that interesting? Because Brahms did exactly what you did. In a, he didn't have a phone, but he wrote to Joseph Joachim, the great violinist, and said, how can I make the violin come out? And how can I, and in fact, he composed the cadenza. Cut the Joachim. doublings out. I mean, he's got doublings all over the place. See, I would love to see what Brahms would sound like. Like his chamber music is my favorite stuff because he can't pile it on the way he can with an orchestra. It's so interesting, John, because there was no greater more educated composer than Brahms. I mean, this man had, uh, he was in a sense the first musicologist. But I'm sure that an orchestrator like Berlioz or Rimsky-Korsakov, who really were untrained, I mean, he, he, he played the guitar a bit, um, Berlioz. It's this the man, Russians and the French you're talking about, yeah. not the Germans. I mean, the Germans were not interested in orchestration per se, they were interested in masses of sound. The, the French and the Russians were interested in color, yeah. and that's what you're talking about, all those composers. But Brahms typifies a kind of generation that wanted a massive sound. And the only trouble is it's not so good for certain things like concertos. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why would you, you know, we were talking about Mozart before, and Mozart in the 19th century was relegated to a great predecessor of Beethoven, because progress was a, the big motive in the 19th century, and anything before Wagner, a Bellini opera, that's no good. Wagner's now the big machine. Um, but now, in the late 20th century, this is the most performed composer in the world. I mean, every day, five new recordings appear. Why? Why do you think? Well, um, 
he's a great composer, but that doesn't Absolutely. mean all of his music is great. Some of it I find rather boring, if oh. you want to know the truth. I don't even like the piano sonatas, but I love the concertos, but most of those of piano sonatas are boring. Uh, but nobody dares say so. And they're so. played boringly, unfortunately. Yes, they are, but let's face it, they're not as great as some of the other the stuff. You're talking about the, some of the symphonies, the operas, and the piano concertos, and the violin concertos, they're fabulous. You're talking about a lot of those piano works, not the late fantasies and stuff, they're really good, but some of those piano sonatas are just okay. But why? Why? You why? look at the, the Schwann you, record guide, page after page, the castations, the, the Well, the everybody Vernamente. gets in fashion, but I think it has to do with the fact that it's become so much a performer art that it's no longer Mozart's Mozart anyway. It's going to be, you know, Scholte's Mozart, Olivine's Mozart. Um, it's not going to be Scholte, Olivine's Corleano. Uh, and I think there's a basic attitude in performers that uh, if they take Mozart, they basically create pieces. Mozart being akin to the lighting and the stagehands and the various other things that supply a, a person with the needs, but Mozart is supplying them with pitches and so forth, but they create. Because since Mozart has been on so much, he's fair game now for the great performers to make great statements. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I mean, people like Manuel de Falla felt that everything before Beethoven was primitive music. Mm -hmm. he, he once said that. Um, yeah. And you know, there are all sorts of different views on this. I love Mozart. Um, I, I love his chamber music. I mean, there's glorious stuff. I just don't like all the music, but anybody who wrote 600 and something pieces can't write them all great. I mean, you know, he was a different kind of person than Beethoven. Beethoven really labored over every piece, and there are very few duds. Um, Mozart tossed them off, and there are more duds, and then there are a lot of masterpieces, too. But what is the, the flavor, the content of his art, which so makes us respond? The 19th century didn't care about it. It was like a Rococo doll. Is it today that uh, we need that relief, that, that wonderful sunny spirit that, that permeates so many of his works? It could be. I mean, I think, he's, I think he's got a beautiful spirit. I think he's a great melodist. And I think that, you know, today, in an age where melody has been denied so long by so many pressures, that Mozart is, you know, a supremely gifted melodist. And it gives the opportunity in a concert of presenting gorgeous mel melodic material, and then you get into your other stuff as developmental and, uh, you know, fugal and whatever, but, you know, you've got your Mozart for your beautiful mm -hmm. tunes. Well, speaking of Mozart, he must have been on your mind because your new opera, The Ghosts of Versailles, which, by the way, will be given its world premiere, I believe, in December of this year? December 19th, the Metropolitan Opera. Now, yeah. uh, this audience, it's, it's only a, a little drop in the bucket of the 3,700 seats in the Mets, but, I mean, they may come, so let's tell them about it. Uh, it's, it's suggested by Beaumarchais, so Mozart must have been in your mind too. Well, he is, in, he is part of it too, but actually it's, uh, it's a grand opera buffa, first of all. Uh, that is, it, it, it is fun and wild and demented, as well as being serious. Um, and it is, takes place in the Versailles in Marie Antoinette's small theater um, in the present, where Marie Antoinette for 200 years and the ghosts of the court of Louis have been sitting around and she's been bemoaning the loss of her head and empire. And Beaumarchais, the playwright of the Barbara and Sevilla Marriage of Figaro and La Mer Coupable, the third of the Beaumarchais trilogy, has been courting her for 200 years <laughs> unsuccessfully. And the, <laughs> what happens in this is that um, to win her love, he brings back Figaro and Almaviva and all his characters to life on the stage of the Met with their own little orchestra. And hands them her necklace, and with the necklace, they are to sell the necklace, spirit her off to the new world where she will settle in Philadelphia with him. Um, and so we have, on the stage of the Met, its own little opera house, and we go back to the world of the past. We have an 11-minute Figaro aria. Uh, we go back into the seduction of uh, Rosina by Cherubino, which took place after the marriage of Figaro and before La Mer Coupable, and all of the plot is the world of the ghosts and watching an opera and commenting on it and then getting embroiled in it. And then finally in act two, the French Revolution rears its head and we find we're in too deep water and serious grand opera. Mm. The end of act one, I might add, is a Turcomania scene. Uh, Teresa Stratus is singing Marie Antoinette, God willing. Um, Hocken Hagegard is Beaumarchais. Uh, Marilyn Horn is Samira, the exotic Egyptian dancer who comes in uh, and in the Turkish embassy scene at the end of Act One, which is our homage to the Turkomania that we loved so much. I happen to love like the Italian Algiers and Abduction of the Seraglio, all those wonderful uh, pieces. And uh, the whole last scene of Act One takes place in the Turkish embassy in Paris and is quite wild. Um, 
and you'll enjoy it. It's very tuneful and also quite wild. Like altered, there are parts like altered states, and there are parts like what I'm going to play in a moment. I guess the little mm -hmm. folk song setting. Yeah. In fact, we should we, we should, should do that. Begin um, now. This one, by the way, this is a little folk song setting, and just to about chronology, just so you understand, I, I think it's important to play this to realize this was written rather recently. And altered states was written in 1980. And the composers don't necessarily progress into dissonance from consonance, as people think, or from simplicity into complexity. These are three Irish folk songs that um, my friend Robert White sings with Ransom Wilson playing the flute. And it's just for voice and flute. And this one is She Moved Through the Fair, which I set because I think it's one of the great melodies of all time, as Irish folk songs can be. And then I set the flute accompaniment so that it's not accompanied with piano at all, but only with a single flute. Very lyrical, very simple. Hmm. I was listening, my eye spotted this um, piece in the New York Times, and I see that you have just been elected to the Academy of Arts and Letters, right. which is a tremendous honor, and that you uh, just won uh, a tremendous award, the 1991 Grawmeyer Award, 
uh, which emanates from Louisville, Kentucky. So you must be feeling very good about uh, uh, your pain. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I want to get right into another small piece, about three minutes. Uh, your, your piano concerto is a four-movement work, right? right? Right, Tell us a little bit about the uh, work. I think you once told me something extraordinary, that you were um, with Horowitz and he actually looked at your score. He was contemplating. He titillated many people with these things through his life. He would say, oh, I'm going to do your concerto, but if, uh, and Barber himself had, you know, hoped that he would do um, right. his concerto, and uh, um, it would never happen, but you told me that he sight-read it? Yeah, actually, I was working with Horowitz uh, in the 60s for that television show, An Historic Return, that thing, and CBS did. I was working with Roger Anglinger, and main, mainly our job was to go to his house and convince him to do it. And uh, <laughs> in that, you know, he was interested in what I was doing, and I had uh, written this piano concerto, and um, I brought over the music, and he started playing it at sight, full speed ahead, not only musically extraordinarily well, you know, but this technical force, but talking the whole time through about what a great sight reader he was. <laughs> and it was really something. This nun stopping, could anybody else do this? Isn't it amazing? And he would do this, and he'd be playing, and I'd, and I'd be flipping pages. And no. uh, it really went on like that. And he was storming through the last movement. At one point, he hit a chord, and his fifth finger was on the wrong note, and I was sitting nearby. And I don't know what happened. I reached over and picked up the finger and put it on the right note. And all of a sudden, his head turned around and looked at me. And I realized, uh, I think I did the wrong thing. <laughs> um, what happened to, to ruin the, the coda of the piece, he was steaming into the coda when Wanda ran downstairs yelling and screaming that the cat was dying. This horrible cat, I say that because it ruined the performance at the end of the piece, had urea poisoning and was clawing the air and meowing and making horrible sounds. And they, were, they went up and they didn't know what to do. And I said, I think you should call the vet, which to them was an unbelievable idea. So they called the vet. Who it came could over. take days They to rang do it. the cat. That's what you do. <laughs> you ring the cat and everything's all right. And he never finished the piece. Mm. But uh, yeah, I did. Uh, he did like it. He said it's very Russian. That's what he liked about it. It's, mm. it's, it's a Russian temperament. This was written in the 60s, 1967. It's a very early piece of mine, and uh, it's in that school of like, American, Russian, kind of dramatic, clean sounds. And I guess that um, David likes this movement because although it's a 30 minute piece, this movement's about two and a half or three minutes as a scherzo between the first movement and the second. This is a live performance of James Toko doing it in Atlanta with the Atlanta Symphony um, about uh, a year or two ago. Very good. Wonderful well, you know, uh, apropos though, Horowitz's cat before we hear the movement, and uh, unfortunately, Horowitz, of course, is not to be heard on this recording, but um, uh, not everyone loved his playing. Uh, of that cat, he said to me, he said, uh, the cat only likes Wanda and the cat hates my playing. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't be loved. Well, I'm not every... fond of that cat either, I have to tell you. <laughs> it's, it's dead. Um, <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> he may have killed it. Um, we're going to hear this, this scherzo from the piano concerto. Which year is this? 67, 68. Oh, so this is an early work. Early piece.
the scherzo is a wonderful foil for the rest of the uh, movement, um, and it's one of the really surviving concertos of the uh, late 60s. Um, you're getting up in the morning, and you're, you're working on your opera, and you can't bear to, to work on the opera anymore. Is there sometimes just a hunger that's overwhelming that you need now to work on a violin piece or a, a piano work or something else? Um, I only write one piece at a time. Uh, I know composers, some composers write six and seven pieces. I think uh, I get obsessed with one. So when I'm doing one, there isn't any possibility uh -huh. of thinking about another piece yes. uh, until it's all done. Um, and then I like to try to write something very different. For example, now I'd like to write a string quartet mm -hmm. because I've got, you know, between the opera and the symphony, I, it's like monsters. I want to ask you this. I've heard that the opera, composing an opera, is, is one of the most monumental things a human being can enter into. Is that correct? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's really not, by the way, the same kind of difficulty I think as writing a large-scale symphonic work because of its, the idea that it's sectional and composed that way, but the problem with opera is that um, you're not the boss. It's like writing for a film, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. You, you know, the director takes it over and wants to do something with it, and the diva wants to do something else with it, and the conductor and the lighting people. So in many ways, um, your vision, they don't listen to you quite mm -hmm. the same way they mm -hmm. do when you write a symphonic piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, I expect, you know, because I'm used to the symphonic world, I expect to go into a rehearsal and they say, what do you want? Um, it doesn't seem to work that way in opera. They seem to think that you wrote those dots on the page, but you really don't know what you want on a stage because you don't know that much about it. You know, the director knows more, and the stage, the scenic designer knows more, and the diva knows more. And it's, it's, it's like being a film composer. You're just a cog in the wheel. And I'm not sure I'm crazy about that because, um, you know, when I wrote the opera, I really did know what I want, and I still know what I want. And so we've had, uh, the Met and I have had our little difficulties. Um, about certain areas, and I must say that things are turning out very well now, and uh, I think they got the idea that we know what we want, but it was convincing because they're, first of all, used to their composers dead. I <laughs> like them that way. Um, and, you know, I can understand that. Uh, you know, they, when I come to them with problems, I'm sure the first thought is, well, Verdi doesn't bother us, and Wagner doesn't bother <laughs> us, but you're coming all the time and driving us crazy, you know? And so it's a very different thing than the symphonic world who's used to dealing with the living. And um, I kind of like you know, people that are used to dealing with the living. Um, so opera is a little different. It's, uh, and also because, as I said, they feel that the composer is a person who writes music and opera is theater and he really doesn't know enough about it. And you know, when you think about the stage director, and we have a wonderful stage director, by the way, and I love him and he's doing a great job. But you know that you've seen all these Mozart operas set in Trump Tower and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, that there weren't any stage directors. You know, Puccini <laughs> staged his own opera. He said, you sit there, you stand there, you walk over, you kiss him, you stab her. You know, I mean, that's the way it went. Verdi did it, they did it. They didn't have stage directors. Nowadays, the stage director is, is like the movie director. He's the, the focus of the opera. It's gotten into a very bizarre situation. And I'm not sure that it's a good one, but it's mainly, of course, because they're performing the same old operas 2,000 times, no. unlike movies, you know? And so, uh, you know, when you see the 75th performance production of the same opera, you do want to see something different. But then again, with a new opera, you don't. You want to see what the composer really wanted the first time, so you have a frame of reference. And getting that across was a little difficult, but we got it across, and now we are having, I think, a representative and very good production of the opera. The designer is John Conklin, who's wonderful, and Colin Graham, the director, has been terrific. But nope. it's been a battle, and you know, it's, I'm not used to that. That's yeah, all. yeah. When it's over, um, it of course must be extraordinary, this whole mixed media thing. Uh, opera is so expensive to produce. Yeah, I mean, have you already felt oh my God, I'll never see my opera again? Because well, that's the history the of American opera is very bleak. I mean, what do we have? I mean, I know. Copeland himself could not, you know, make an, a success. Uh, no. uh, Minotti has, but with a few pieces, and look what's happened to that yeah. poor man, the way he's treated by the press. I mean, uh, it's just cruel and vicious. But the thing is that, you know, I, I mean, I, I considered this, I thought of, of an image for this was my opera, my Met Commission was the Hope Diamond, complete with curse. You know, <laughs> I mean, I took it, it was irresistible, you don't turn down the Met for their 100th anniversary, you can't. At the same time, you know it's gonna kill you. And that's how I felt about it. And sure enough, it's proved to be exactly what I thought. That is, every step of the way has been mind-bogglingly difficult because but it's the world of opera. this must make you very happy. 
Oh, no. It does Real not pain. make me happy. You know, this kind of pain <laughs> does not make me happy. Um, what it is also is that, like Copeland said to me years ago, he said, why do you want to write an opera? He said, why do you want to spend four, it turned out to be more like eight years, writing an opera that gets done once or twice. And of course, it's all economics. You know, I mean, Puccini had, a, Madame Butterfly was a flop, and he remounted it a year or two later. Now, how can you afford to remount an opera that's not a success today? You can't. Okay. It costs too much money, especially an opera like this. It's a very big opera. If it doesn't get raves, and whatever does in New York, how can it be done again? No one can afford it, because it's not like a symphony. Say my symphony got bad reviews. Well, the conductor could put it on the program with Itzhak Perlman playing the Tchaikovsky Concerto, and he wouldn't worry about it, neither would the management of the orchestra. They'd say, well, we got a full house. We'll play his piece. Mm. An opera is the whole evening. They can't do that. It has to be a success for yeah. them to go on. Yeah. Even Sam Barber with Anything Cleopatra couldn't have a piece that once it failed at the Met, he couldn't get other productions. He got Juilliard to do it and revitalize it there. Sure. And I think they're going to do it in Chicago next year. Um, Lord Byron, Virgil Thompson, that flopped. Well, you Bernstein's know, flopped in You Milan. know, Lord Byron was commissioned by the Met. They paid him and they never did it. They That's the other thing it. about the Met, that they auditioned the opera. They pay you for it, but they don't say they're going to do it when they commission it. They just say they're commissioning it. And well, then they decide if they're going to do it. We're looking forward to the Ghosts of Versailles. Yeah. Um, John, I want to play some of the uh, symphony, which is a work that has been, I haven't heard it yet. It's just been on CD. And by the way, a great deal of uh, John Corleano's music is, is on CD. Um, and uh, uh, the symphony was just recorded and released in, in this month, I believe. It was released a few weeks ago. Who? Um, Irado Records has signed a new contract with Chicago Symphony because of Daniel Barenboim, their new music director. And they released two records, the uh, Helen Laban and this as their premier release. And they're going to be five years. For five years, they have a recording contract with CSO and, and Danny Barenboim. I've read uh, reviews in this press release, and you know, everyone says that it's, it's a work of great drama, also of anguish. Is this, is this anguish over, uh, over the state of humanity? No, 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 this is a very specific piece. Um, this piece is a piece I wrote for my friends who died of AIDS and one of who was dying. And um, obviously, it's a very um, angry and frustrated and, un and, and a piece with, with, with great tension attached to it because of the subject matter. Um, I was um, a composer in residence for three years in Chicago, and part of the composer residency is writing a piece. And when Schulte and I talked about it, uh, he originally wanted me to write a concerto for orchestra. Um, but the spring that I was going to start on the piece, which is like two years ago, three years ago probably, three years ago, um, my closest friend of 30 years, I mean, all the people in this piece are friends of like 30 years, my whole life really, um, was diagnosed with pneumocystis and had AIDS. And I've had a lot of musical friends who have died. And this was the last straw for me because this uh, was a musical colleague whom I shared um, when I was composing my thoughts and was able to conceptualize with me. He was a great musician, a great person, uh, funniest person in the world, most delightful human being in the world, as well as brilliant, talented, etc. And so many people are unaware of this loss, and I was so upset and horrified that um, I felt I had to write a symphony, which I never thought I would write, because I always said I wouldn't write a symphony. But this, is the, um, this was the occasion to write one. A symphony, you never would write one because what, of the form being old-fashioned or no, what? No, because um, I like to be useful and I didn't think that the world needed a symphony I by see, me. I, I mean, see. you know, they've got a lot of good ones. Let's uh, hear uh, the first six minutes or so. Well, let me just tell you a moment about yeah. it before because it's rather important. Because the first movement is about this friend of mine who was a concert pianist. Uh, it's called A Rage and Remembrance, this movement. And you will hear a great deal of rage and quite dissonant, horrifying music as well as the remembrances. Now. The rage that you will hear, starting on a single note that starts on the strings and gets more and more intense as they change to higher positions, um, begins the work, as well as a kind of heartbeat motive that accelerates, as panic does, as fear does, in, in the fear of this disease. But alternating with that will be a musical recollection. And um, when this piece was played, this pianist attended the concerts and died a week after the premiere. Um, a, another close friend of his, the, great pianist Stephen Huff, who was also a saint in addition to being a pianist, um, volunteered his services. His manager actually called and asked permission to play the offstage piano in honor of this pianist friend of mine. And he plays a piece that this pianist played ever since he was a child, uh, the Godofsky transcription of the Albanese tango. And so that tango melody 
gets mixed with another melody in the celli of mine, and they become one and grow. So what you're going to have is the first few minutes of a kind of incredible rage of multiple accelerations of piled on sounds, and then these high strings and this re remembrance, which then becomes very nostalgic, which will then work its way back into the rage. Since this movement takes 14 minutes, and I'm told we can only go about six, I'm going to fade him out somewhere along the buildup back to the rage, so you can at least get the two poles of intensity of this movement. Um, aside from that, I guess I can't tell you anymore. The whole work is 43 minutes. 43.
the whole thing. Thank you. I think we had to hear the whole movement. I don't, I don't see how you could have even I had the energy to raise your hand to. I didn't know where to stop it, so I couldn't. Well, we're going it. to hear it in New York when? Well, you hear it. Uh, there are two different performances in New York next season. One is the New York Philharmonic with Leonard Slatkin in, in January. And the Chicago Symphony is taking it to Europe and coming through Carnegie Hall in April with Daniel Barenboim taking it on their way to Europe for the European tour. Well, the, the use of the Albanus in there, John, is so poignant that it's, it's you know, heartbreaking. Um, we've learned a lot about John Corleano. We learned uh, um, many of his opinions, but I think hearing some of his music was a very great experience for us. And I want to thank you for being here. Join us next week when uh, you studied with him. Otto Wonderful Looning man. will Wonderful. be here on June 7th at 7 o'clock. Come and say hello to John Corleano. Oh, no.